Well, welcome to the show. I've got with me Tom Zeliff. How are you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing tonight, Josh? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I'm excited to. Uh, I'm excited we got to connect and we can uh, kind of hear your story and uh, and hear about the projects you're working on and whatnot. But before we do that, let's uh, let's get to know you a little bit, man. What uh, what's your history with gaming? What uh, where did it all start? Well, growing up in the '80s, uh, born in '79, of course, with like most people, I had a Nintendo. I mean, who didn't? Yeah, everybody had to start somewhere, and that's uh, Super Mario Brothers, and those kinds of games were where I started. And I was terrible at them. I did not do very well. Found warp pipes, but I couldn't actually finish that game. Uh, I had one of the original gold Zelda cartridges, nice. and had no idea what I was doing there either. I was completely lost and couldn't get very far in the game, and just generally was not very good at it. But I kept playing. I kept playing, and many years later, I came back to those games and suddenly realized, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Ah, and made it much further through. And I was quite happy to, uh, you know, using some guides to see what the heck is going on on Zelda, because if you remember, it was very vague in what, what you're supposed to do, that you did not get a lot of help in that game. So working my way through that, I got through Dungeons 1 through 5, skipped 6 because it was particularly hard, went to 7 to pick up the Magic Sword, go back to 6, and the cartridge lost the game. Oh no! Did the battery die, or did yeah, or something? Something in there died. You know, I had that funky thing you had to do with holding reset, hitting power to save your game. That's and right. I was doing that every time. And one time I went back there to resume my game. I was like, all right, I'm going to go after Dungeon Six. And ah, uh, where'd it go? <laughs> oh, ah. So I never actually finished that one. Um, that went from there. I, you know, I had a Game Boy, had a Super Nintendo, had an N64. Uh, I've got a Wii. Um, never went the Sega or PlayStation routes. Um, played a couple of games on there, but mostly just stuck to the Nintendo games and Nintendo systems all the way through. Uh, and had a lot of fun with all of that. And then got older, had too many other things that ate up all my time, and now, sadly, I don't get a chance to game. It's not for lack of wanting. I'd love to. No time. <laughs> Just no free time for it anymore. Yeah, that's uh, that's understandable. I uh, I don't do too much myself. Do you? If I do, it's at the expense of. Uh, last night I decided to give up two hours of sleep to play a little bit of Destiny, but uh, I, I paid for it today with a <laughs> with a headache and numerous cups of coffee. Yeah, so... you look a little bleary eyed there. Some redness <laughs> and baggage going on. <laughs> I have many of those late nights too, but it's not because of gaming. It's a completely other uh, another project, which is what got you interested in talking to me today. All right. Well, that's that's cool, man. But before we jump into it, what do you got a favorite NES game? Like, is there one in particular that you just could play over and over again? You know, I'd have to jump up to the Super Nintendo, and the one I played more than anything uh, would be the original Mario Kart. Oh, As okay. My friends and I. It, when we first got it, we played it like crazy, playing the battle mode. Uh, I worked my way through all the races, finishing Rainbow Road on the hardest possible setting with the hardest to control cart. Um, I was the Koopa Trooper guy myself because he was the he was Me not too. the fastest but easiest to control, and he yeah. best steering and cornering to get around that co those courses. That's so, true. got really good at. It. We had a lot of fun playing that, and then after a while, after many many months of play, kind of you know other games came along and we put that one aside, and then after six months. Pulled it out again, and it sat in there for in the machine for the next three or four months straight. As we were just challenging ourselves to do things like get faster laps on time trials on certain tracks, just to see, you know, there's barely any power ups other than the one mushroom you get for every lap completed and the the boost start. And other than that, just pure driving skill. How could can you cut those corners and get through there just to shave another hundredth of a second off of the previous guy's time? And my friends and I would just trade the controller around, do it over and over and over and over again, trying to see who could just get that much perfect faster. So we had a lot of fun. That was probably the game that got the most play. That's rad, man. Did you have a favorite track by chance? Uh, I really enjoyed all the battle modes, those tracks in there, because there's so many stealthy things that you could do and tricky things there. We could just write books on various ways to uh, you know, hit people with green turtle shells, not even red ones, just to mess them up with green ones. Um, but for the regular races, um, one of the ones that we spent a lot of time on was the first of the Ghost, uh, Ghost Valley ones. <laughs> yes. uh, and that's one we were getting so good that we were 
completely drifting sideways through every one of those corners, scraping every one of those blocks as we went along, occasionally knocking one down, but not actually losing any momentum from it. Just yeah. all the way along those on every single one of those turns to keep the top speed in there, and it was just nuts. Uh, that was a that was a pretty cool track, and, and we figured if you're going fast enough, you could actually make the jump onto that shortcut uh, little bridge. Uh, but you had to be going top speed and jump just the last possible second, you'd make it over. Yeah, I think that was actually my favorite track too. My uncle and I used to do time trials on that one forever, and I, I still love the sound of those uh, the the tire squeaking on the wood the wood track. It was like mm-hmm. kind of like a being in a bowling alley or something, you know. <laughs> exactly, that was a really fun track, and they really it was such a great game. It spawned in such a great series too that just keeps going. Yeah, have you have you played Mario Kart 8 at all? Have you seen that one? You know, this is where the the current gaming. I just don't have any time to catch up with that. I picked up the Mario Kart on the Wii, okay. uh, and the first one of those, and I played that some. Uh, it was kind of fun using the the plastic wheel, and even bought a second plastic wheel too. But that was really when I was running out of time to play, so I didn't get that far into that. And since it's just, I'd love to, but lack of time, you know, it just gets away from you. For sure, for sure. The reason I ask is the Super Nintendo track that they uh, that they put on Mario Kart 8. It looks all aged and worn and everything. Mm-hmm. It's just it. They did an excellent job with it, though. So even if you look it up on YouTube or whatever, it's uh, it's worth checking out. It's 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 pretty awesome. So nice. I'll have to do that. Take a look and see what it looks like. Yeah, for sure. Let's uh, let's talk about your your game, man. You're working on something, right? Yeah, I've been working on something. Actually, it's uh, been out for quite a while, uh, and that's going to be a No Limits Coaster Simulation. Uh, this is a project that, you know, gaming has certainly been something I enjoy doing as a, as a hobby and pastime, but my real pa- one of my real big passions in life is roller coasters and amusement parks. Uh, so backing up to give the whole history lesson here. Uh, go ahead and settle in, grab some popcorn, uh, get ready for a nice story here. <laughs> um, way back in the day... Before even Nintendo was out there, uh, and before I had a computer, there was a game that came along called uh, just Coaster by Disney. It was for the PC, uh, such as it was back then, and you had to run it out of DOS, and it was fantastic. Um, I bought it before I even had a computer to play it on. And I would just take it to friends' houses and school lab and play it there. And I carried the install disc with me and another disc that was holding onto the coasters I made in it. Uh, and it was great, because it was... It, fun game. It wasn't much of a game, really. It was just construction. You're building a coaster, and that's all you did. You just built a coaster, and you rode it, and you had fun. And they had these weird personalities that would give you some kind of a score that was incredibly arbitrary at times, but it was great. All you had to do was just build coasters. It had a lot of limitations, though, because it could only make 90-degree turns left and right, and straight hills that could only go up and down a certain amount. You had three different types of loops that you could use, and that was it. But hey, it's all you had, and it was a good time. So, going a little further forward from there, the next thing that came out that uh, for gaming-wise that fit in with amusement parks was uh, Theme Park, which was a British program where you could kind of—it's really kind of a predecessor to the idea of all those tycoon games and roller coaster tycoon. Uh, that it was very. Uh, it worked because it the same kind of idea where you're building a park, putting all these rides in place, and managing that, and you know, building a couple of little simple coasters and stuff, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, heavier on the management side than the build side, but it worked. And you could kind of ride your rides, because you can bring up a properties panel for the ride and hit a little hit a button to ride it, and it would show you just this looping video uh, that was pre-rendered and, you know, and the best that the really <laughs> early 90s could do in terms of computer graphics. So it was not a lot to write home about these days. Yeah. But it, hey, it, you know, you could still build kind of a coaster, and it kind of worked. And if you want to see some comedy, look it up later on YouTube and see what it looked like and get some chuckles out of it. Uh, after that came, of course, Roller Coaster Tycoon, and who hasn't heard of that? It was huge. Giant monster blockbuster hit, for uh, just because it was a lot of fun to play, even for non-amusement park nerds. You know, it was just a good game. It was great balance, it was easy to put things together, it was bright and colorful, and the thing that really appealed to the nerd like myself who loves amusement parks, all the little rides in there looked just like the real thing little cartoon shrunk down version, but you could tell you know, each of these coaster types lined up with the real life thing, and it was a lot of fun because of that. So many, 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 many late nights playing that, building parks, and really when I should have gotten to bed and gotten ready for work in the morning. Uh, had fun doing that, but the problem is you can't ride any of those rides. 
can make this amazing park, cram it full of stuff, but he can't ride anything. While that was get was big and popular and Roller Coaster Tycoon 2 was out, another little program came along on the internet called Ultra Coaster 3D, which was this little uh, shareware program that could build roller coasters just all that was used to build a roller coaster in free form, kind of like Disney's coaster. But now it was completely free. You could build anywhere in this box and make the track do anything you want, which was a nice step in the right direction. There were some problems with the physics. Uh, biggest problem being that if you started a, a hill and you went down kind of a real gradual spiral, where it just kind of went round and around and around and around and slowly built up more and more speed, you'd then be able to go up a hill that was higher than where you started. And you could do this over and over and over and over again, never need a chain lift or anything to give you more speed, and clearly that's just wrong. So that that didn't quite work. <laughs> you couldn't customize it with your own trains. Well, not really. It came with just a single train. Um, at the time, when those games were both out, I had uh, moved on from working at amusement parks and actually got a job at uh, New World Computing, which is um, a standalone game company for a while that later be was acquired by 3DO. Uh, which may be a name you recognize from way back in the day there when they made oh, their yeah. own their own hardware system, which had a terrible reason why they came up with the name 3DO, which was literally first you had audio, then video, now 3DO. Eh? 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 See what we did there? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, yeah you just you roll your eyes and <laughs> fall so over backwards from that I one. I didn't know. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. And you... <sighs> I groaned and I worked there. Um, <laughs> before New World Computing was bought up by 3DO, though, they uh, they were their own game publishing studio. Uh, started by the, a gentleman, John Van Kanigan, way back in the 80s, all because he wanted to play Dungeons & Dragons on his computer. Nothing like that existed, so he made it, just in his apartment by himself. Uh, and put out the first game, Might and Magic 1, by himself. And it was a hit got enough money from it that he was able to create My Magic 2 and this whole series of Might and Magic games uh, that also spawned a turn-based strategy game that was called Heroes of Might and Magic that was still in kind of the same universe. Um, I joined up as a tester, first of all, to do some testing on Heroes of Might and Magic 3, one of the expansion packs for that, and Might and Magic 7 were the games that I uh, tested at that company. And I got in there because I had a cousin uh, whose uh, husband worked there as an artist. Some positions opened up in the testing department. I was into computer games, and I was able to get in there. So uh, that's how I got in my foot in the door uh, the first time in the game company and kind of got to see what it's like to test games. And a lot of people think, oh, that's going to be the greatest job ever, right? No. Mm -mm. No, and you're shaking your head too. You you sound like you already kind of know this, because there is some playing of the games involved. Because clearly you have to make sure that the gameplay elements are functioning, right? But then you also have other tasks, like, all right, in the level editor here that the players get to use, I need you to place every single one of the 250 items, make sure that they placed and appear right, and make sure you can delete them all. Yeah. <laughs> And for those listening only, I'm mouse gesturing right now, and which of course is great for radio. And yet, yeah, the <laughs> tedium involved with some of those tasks is just obnoxious. And then other times you'd be playing through the the main my main might magic series was a role playing game, big drawn out quest, and every so often they put a new build out that would kill your save game. Oh, so you're nice. trying to make your way through it to make sure everything's working, but again, they'd kill all the save games, so you'd have to start over. And you got so sick and tired of that first starting island that you're just, ugh. But you had to go in there, go into the cave, or talk to people, get the quest, go into the cave, run past the dragon without killing him just to get the thing you needed, get back out again, then you're done with your first quest. Uh, one of the guys got so bored with doing that over and over and over again, he figured out a way he could kill that dragon, which we're too low level. You're not supposed to be able to kill the dragon that soon in the game. It's supposed to be way overpowering. You're just supposed to run past it, get what you need, and run out. Uh, but he found that if there, there's a little gap in the geometry where you could kind of hide the little offshoot of the cave, the dragon could not hit you. But you could shoot arrows, and you had a little bit of supply at it. Granted, you're doing one damage, two damage each time if you maybe hit it. It just took enough time, and eventually you killed the dragon. And it would drop some kind of epically powerful item that you should not have that early in the game. So once he figured out that safe spot and how you could cheese the dragon like that, it was just a matter of time. So he took a stack of quarters, held it down on the attack button, and went off to lunch. Came back, 
dead dragon, free big item, and whammo. <laughs> Yeah, they fixed the uh, cave so you couldn't hide there anymore, and the dragon wouldn't drop anything like he was supposed to. But it was, you find things like that just to try and make life more livable when you have really tedious projects like that that you have to do that break the fun stuff all the time. That and the Nerf Wars. The Nerf Wars were really good. Because uh, back then, everybody had CRT monitors instead of the LCD flat screens, and the suction darts really land well on the glass, and they stay there. Oh, yeah. So you'd be sitting there playing, and you'd be working on some kind of a press, and all of a sudden, <laughs> right in the middle of your screen from across the room. And we were all so used to that that you just let it sit there. <laughs> and you just keep doing what you're doing. You wouldn't even acknowledge the fact that there is a bright green dart on your screen uh, on that one. And we also had other fun things we would do. We'd have uh, sound effects that we would play. So if somebody started complaining and whining too much, we had a sound effect of a baby crying that we would play on top of them whining about something in the game just to kind of underscore the fact that, yeah, dude, shut up. Yeah, we get it. You, you're annoyed by that, but shut up. <laughs> so, so is everyone. Yeah, exactly. So anyways, that's all just kind of some of the fun backstory of, of working there. Uh, after testing a few games, they had some positions open up for level design. And so they went to the testers, because they like to hire from within and promote from within if they can, uh, handed out the level design editor for the Might and Magic games and said, all right, here's how it is. You got a week, put together whatever you can. And the two people that had the most promise that kind of got it more than anybody else got to go in. So voila, I was one of those two people, and I was kind of figuring it out, asking a few questions to get started, and after that, I was putting things together, and I made it in. So I made it in uh, up to actual level design at that point. So that was going to be for Might and Magic 8. Might and Magic 8 was an interesting game engine. By then, it was a little long in the tooth. It was using what was a state-of-the-art engine from back in 1996. And this is um, kind of like, uh, well, really Doom or Wolfenstein 3D. So 2D, 3D, right? You've got yeah, your yeah. 3D worlds, but all the monsters are all sprites. To give you an idea of just how uh, primitive the engine was in certain ways, we had some limitations that we had to work with. For example, when you're, well, there's two different versions of the engine. We had an outdoor engine that kind of went off to infinity, uh, and you had some buildings and trees in it to go around for the outside areas. Then you had your indoor dungeons that you would explore trying to find stuff, right? The outdoor engines, each building, and uh, there was only so many you could have in a, in a map before it ran out of memory, each building could only have 64 polygons. And of course, if you're making a, a big castle, 64 polygons is nothing. So you had to make your bigger castle, keeping it nice and simple, that then cut it into slivers of 64 polygons that would all get placed on top of each other uh, on that one, just because each building, again, only 64 polygons. So you had to get really creative about that. Then the indoor dungeon had an, an even more interesting restriction on it, that it could not draw more than 1,000 triangles, period. Triangle 1001 was not drawn. You just got this Hall of Mirrors effect. So they had tricks to deal with that. They had portals and things so you could have a door shut or you could build S-bends in your level uh, so that, uh, and you put some portals along the way so that it wouldn't draw past the second portal or if the door shuts, it wouldn't draw anything behind that. So that way you're not drawing parts of the level that you're not in. And you had to work a lot of that kind of stuff in there. So here's the challenge that I got to having to do that. Caves. How do you make a cave when you that looks somewhat natural that you can't have the engine see more than a thousand triangles at one time? It's really, really hard. Um, I figured out a method, and I'll, I figured out a way to kind of make it modular, so I kind of made a flat uh, stretch of cave that was six-sided, and then I would just kind of bend it and warp it in the positions I need, putting lots of S-curves and everything all over the place in there, and figured out a way to do it. Um, but I learned a couple of really important skills from doing that, which was um, being able to make kind of complicated shapes while controlling the polygon count in the process, because those are some pretty strict limits, as you can imagine. Yeah. So now to tie that back into Ultra Coaster, you could replace the existing train that was in there with your own train and make your own model in that. So I learned how to do that. Um, to prepare for another game we're working on, we started to learn 3D Studio Max, and I learned how to do some basic modeling in there, how to take the, basically make some objects, and using that, I built my own set of trains for Ultra Coaster 3D, some that were based on real life and looked much more realistic. While that game was out and it has problems, what was the best we had for coaster games, uh, a German gentleman comes out of nowhere, posts some screenshots 
of a roller coaster simulator that just blew everybody's minds out because it looked right. All of the details were exactly like the real life coaster train, and it's actually a German one that. If you're into coasters, you know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, what the train there, you recognize it instantly. You recognize the coaster itself instantly. It's very notable for that. But he got all these details right about it. And not only that, the physics were right. And it, the sound effects were right. And everything about it was just perfect. The screenshots and the, the demo he put out there was just what everybody went, I, I must have this. Because it had the charm of having something that looked like real life, like Roller Coaster Tycoon. And in addition to that, it also had, you know, full 3D. You could build anything you wanted in this in the space there, and it would look just like the real thing. So we were eagerly following that because it gave you the ability also to ride the coasters that you can do in roller coaster tycoon. Everything was scaled to real life and it was great. So at one point along the uh, development of that, he posted on his website that he was looking for somebody to help build train models for his roller coasters. And I went, oh, 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 I built train models for this one and everything like that. I've got background level design blah, 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 and all these pieces, and, and I'm a super giant coaster nerd. I'd love to join. Yeah, I'd like to join your team, right? Uh, I found out after he picked me up, as is the first person joining him on that project, that he had already seen those models and was hoping the guy who made them would email. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. And it worked out perfectly. So I was the first person on the project from there um, building train models for that, and that became No Limits Coaster. It first launched in uh, the year 2000. And okay. went on from there. Uh, we started with eight coaster styles, and over time we added uh, an additional member to the team who does texture art. Because I can build great 3D models of uh, the coasters and keep them low poly so they perform well, adding lots of nerdy details than from the real life things, but they come out as gray blocks. I'm not a graphic artist or a texture artist, so somebody in our community who did, who was doing some really spectacular work of one of the fans of our game could do that kind of stuff. And we asked him to join, and he did, and kind of completed the our little three-member team. Main programmer is in Germany. He was at the time in Wisconsin. That's the texture artist, and now he lives in up in uh, Redmond, Washington, and I'm down here in Los Angeles. So. The whole time we communicated via the internet, we had a little development website set up so we could post messages back and forth to each other and post files we're working on. And we built it up to the point where we had around 29 or 28. Uh, you know, Over the years, we kept adding to it. We ended up with uh, close to 30 train styles in it. Um, we met in, in person a number of times, went on coaster riding vacations, uh, where we went around California, around the Midwest, went to Germany. We got to meet real roller coaster manufacturers, and here's the really amazing thing that com that surprised us like crazy. You know, we were just hoping to sell one or two copies, and you know, just hopefully find some nerds out there that enjoyed it and you know see how it went. It was successful enough that it's the German guys. It's a, oh, his name is Ole Lange. His full time job is working on this from home. Um, Kevin and I, who do the the trains, we have day jobs, but we do this in our spare time. Uh, not only that. A couple of years in, the coaster manufacturers started to notice it and how good it was. And one of them, a company that's called Vacoma, that's done a number of project, a number of roller coasters that people are very familiar with, even if they don't know the name, uh, contacted uh, contacted one of our members working on a special new project. This is a motorbike style coaster they're working on. Uh, through that guy, we got in touch with them and started working with them. And that was the first time we had a coaster company contract us to build their custom idea and put it in the game and put it in our simulator. And we built, they sent over blueprints and we're working on things off the real blueprints and I'm sitting there looking at taking measurements off the real thing so I can build the model just perfectly to scale and realizing I need to see a particular part that isn't shown in the blueprints. And then, you know, late at night I'm emailing the senior designer over at this company over in the Netherlands. Uh, and that, due to the time difference, you know, half an hour later I get a, a file back in here. It's like, oh, here's what you're looking for. And I say, like, oh, yeah, thank you very much. And I start working on it, and I stop and go, what just happened? I'm, I'm emailing with a senior coaster designer. Uh, so it was <laughs> this weird, surreal moment. Of that, uh, that we've since met with other coaster companies. We've worked with a good, you know, dozen or so that of major, major coaster companies, and done custom projects for them. And this year in January, we launched No Limits Two, which was a brand new engine that we wrote from scratch. Again, uh, this is the first engine 
held up pretty well, considering that it lasted about 13 years before we put out the second engine. Uh, but we needed something that had modern graphic capabilities, could do a lot more than the original engine was capable of. So we built an, uh, only spent many years working on another engine from scratch, achieving such milestones as getting dialog boxes to appear so that he could then click on them and make them disappear build the whole editor again from scratch like that, build all the physics in, build all sorts of new abilities so that uh, the train had a lot more features, including being able to make tunnels through the train automatically based on, I want track to go from here to here and have a tunnel, and it's going to cut through the ground and the water, and it'll do that automatically for the player. Mm-hmm. And now with that, we're up to 37 train styles uh, in there that are all 100% real trains. They're, you can find them in your local amusement park. They're all there out there. Uh, and you know, this year also in April, we started a green light campaign to get on Steam. In eight days, we hit green light status. And uh, we launched on Steam in August and have since been going strong there. And we just added workshop support last week, uh, which would be late October. And we're right now in the process of adding Oculus Rift support in uh, to get that one out there and adding yet more trains based on our user requests and uh, what the community is asking for. And we've got our professional clients that are asking for yet more trains going on. and it's amazing, and uh, this whole journey still remains incredible to this day. Because at the core of it, you know, we are guys. We're nerds. We like computers. We like computer games. We love roller coasters, and we wanted to make real roller coasters, stuff that looks as just as good as in real life, on our computers, so that we get done with it and go, so like, that's exactly what I just saw at the park today. And what if it did this instead of that? And I can make that. And when I'm done with it, it looks good. So we made it to make it ourselves happy with that and put a level of detail in there that we were seeing, especially with my nerdy eye for this kind of thing. And what we came up with resonated with the other fans that are like us out there, and it's been doing great. And this crazy journey continues as we keep adding to it. Dude, that's one of the best stories I've heard yet, man. Like, <laughs> Thank you. I I am amazed that I've gotten to live that, actually. And, uh, that last year around this time, I was with my wife and uh, Ole, and we were in Germany touring some parks. We went to a coaster manufacturer there. Before that trip, we had just finished a custom train for them and had just shipped it over there, uh, You know, emailed it over. And then a few days later, we were actually at their their, co- their design facility and their manufacturing plant, and they were showing us what they had already been doing to make a promo video of it, uh, of that exact thing that we were just building. And we got to go into the shop floor where they were, ju- they were just starting to take one of those trains uh, apart so that they could package it up and ship it to the park in China that was building it. So we got to sit in this thing that, you know, just a few days ago I was looking at the blueprints on and modeling it, and now I got to actually go sit, test sit in that, in the factory like that. And I was like, this is so cool. And they were looking at the stuff we do. It's like, what do you do? Is so cool. And we're all nerding out. And it's like, why am I colleagues with these people and on the same level? No, I'm the fan. I should be worshiping you guys. It's it's really crazy and surreal, and it's just a lot of fun. Dude, it's so great to hear that. Basically, I mean, just you've been you've been just chasing your passion, right? And it's just uh, it's just open door after door for you, and it's uh, it's it's very cool. Are there are there plans in the future for you to go full time, or is it? Do you do you like what you do during the day? That it's just fine to have it as a side gig. That's definitely a good question. Um, we'd certainly like to get to that point. Um, one of the difficulties, though, that we are a bit of a niche uh, niche product, and sure. that we yeah, because you know there are a lot of people that really love roller coasters and that go crazy with us, and there are people that spend months working on a project. Uh, in our game, and by the time they're done with it, I really should call it a simulator, when they're done with it, they can take screenshots in there that look, you you couldn't even tell that it's from a simulator. You'd swear it's a photograph. Hmm. And you could pass it off as a photograph of a real real thing, because you can get the lighting set just perfect, the environment, all the textures and everything, and it's just, it's stunning for what can come out of this one. If you look at some of the YouTube videos that are out there, and we put together a roundup every week of the, that week's most impressive ones of the top 10 that we liked, and we're 37 weeks into that, by the way, so 370 projects we featured, and they just keep coming. So it's amazing with everything they've done, but again, it's still a bit of a niche product to be able to generate enough for all three of us to uh, make it our full-time uh, careers right now. So uh, Kevin and I, we... You know, we do okay. We do get some. Uh, we do get some from this, and we also just really enjoy working on it. Uh, but we do have day jobs as well, so that we we 
do need to pay our, our main bills from that one, and this kind of supplements it. For him, Ole over in Germany, this is his for full-time gig, and that's where he gets, a, and has been the whole time, because he was working on No Limits as he was finishing up college, uh, and he hasn't had a, a office job at this point, because that hit, and that's been it for him. So it's been really fortunate. Um, but all that said, you know, we hope to keep going with that one, that we can keep using that to fuel some other ideas that we have, uh, some other uses that we have in mind for the engine, because it's very versatile to do a whole bunch of different things. And we're hoping that we're going to be able to you know, leverage that and then come up with some additional titles. And, you know, if one of those hits like crazy, then we may be working uh, our little virtual studio around the world, uh, working from home completely. Never know where it may end up. Yeah, that's 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 rad, dude. It's really cool to hear. Definitely cool to hear. So let me ask you, like, along this journey, right? And uh, I mean, you've had some some killer stuff happen, obviously. But have there been any like mistakes or learning lessons that you can share with uh, with us? Absolutely. I'm one of the biggest things that. It really has become one of the philosophies I stick to is that it definitely pays to do it right the first time. Because if nothing else, it takes the least amount of overall effort to do it the right way the first time. If you're ever trying to shortcut something or just simply say, ah, you know, it's good enough, it won't be. That will catch up to you at some point. Uh, and a case in point on that, one of the big important things that we have to deal with in or that we're looking at, that we hold ourselves to, is the scale. We want to make sure that we have the scale of these trains as accurate as we can get it. Uh, in some cases, we work with the manufacturers, so we have exact blueprints, and we know the exact dimension of these trains, and we get it perfect. In other cases, we don't have a relationship with the manufacturer at this point, or that's just too old. The equipment is nobody's making this particular one anymore, so we can't really ask anybody for those plans. So in those cases, I've actually taken a string that's got some measurements on it into the park, and while I'm riding the coaster, I'm going, okay, it's about this long, and this over here, and this long over here, and then jot that down, and then afterwards, okay, it was like like this long. Uh, and I'm not kidding about that. I, we, we actually, I actually did do that. And I was figuring out the spacing between seats recently, and I, after I got off the train, I just held my arms to the seat back. It's like, okay, here to here, so about there to about there. So I just kind of measured with my arms, then remembered what that was, and I got home, put out a measuring tape. It's like, okay, that's going to be 20 inches. Okay, so that I could have that measurement solid. Um, initially, it was just kind of a point of pride knowing that we had those numbers correct. In No Limits 2, we added a walk mode, so you could actually walk around from about a six foot high or so person and you see what it's like to actually walk around your park. You know, the standard uh, WASD uh, movement, including jump and everything like that, just like your favorite first person shooter. So now, since you have that point of view inside the game, it was even more important to have that scale correct. And now that we're working on Oculus Rift, so you can actually look at it in 3D, now you're completely right there. And if the scale is not correct on something, it shows because that's too small compared to everything else. There's so many things that are perfectly scaled that that one that isn't stands out. And one of the trains, actually one of the companies in there has a number of trains that we've done that they share a number of the same parts, the same seat and the same restraint. This is what I was ultimately getting to. And a long time ago when I made it, I, I, I didn't have measurements to work from, so I had to eyeball the seats and made it and looked pretty good. And we've been using it since then. When we did No Limits 2, we did some updates to the trains, got some additional textures, they got better. But I kept the seats in place because we were we had so much work to do with the new trains, some of those trains that took a few months to build because, uh, you know, spare time plus very, very, very detailed these days. And I, it's like, you know what, I just need to just carry those seats forward again. But I noticed they're not quite big enough. Oh, no. And now I was aware of that, but I was like, you know what, Fixing that would break a number of things. It would be a lot of work to go because there would be five or six trains affected to go stretch the seats out like that. We have enough other projects we're working on. But now that the guys are seeing it in full 3D, now it completely stands out. And now we have to fix that. So oh, no. if I had caught it earlier, and I did actually have a drawing buried in my man, folders and folders of reference photos. I did have something that I could have used as a good scale uh, reference at the time. If I had done that seat the right shape the first time, I wouldn't be doing it again. And so that's why 
or trying to fix it later with all the ramifications of a whole bunch of things that all use the same geometry now. So it's definitely, and I found this in my professional work too, at my full, my day job, shortcutting anything just to try and get something done or just to you know make it not take as long will come back to bite you. And you don't want to do something you know halfway. You got to take the time, and the effort, get it to where it really needs to be so that you never have to touch it again. And when you get it to that point, then you're good. And then, then you have a true quality item that will stand up on its own, and you don't have to go, well, look at this, but don't go over there. It doesn't look quite look on that side. It's, you can just simply say, go ahead. And we're at the point where you know, we can show people all of our screenshots now. They look at this stuff, and the, the game sells itself because they look at the, this, the amazing things that are produced out of it. They're like, wow, that's awesome instead of going, well, it looks pretty good. But that kind of looks weird. You know, they just look at all of it and it goes, that's amazing. Hmm. And that's all it comes from just make sure you do it the right the way the first time. Yeah, I mean, basically, they get to walk around in your painting. That's a good way of putting it. Because uh, it is it is very much creating artwork, or in some ways it's so realistic, it's kind of like a Photoshop or uh, that one, that you, you just create amazing work in this that the environment feels so lush and so real, and with all of the, the full scripting engine that people are in there, uh, they're finding all sorts of interesting ways to use that scripting engine for more than what we thought you could do with it. Um, so before we added the ability to detect button uh, button clicks and button hit detection, stuff like that, somebody had already figured out how to make a working whack-a-mole, <laughs> which was particularly impressive because there wasn't anything to detect which one you're aiming at. He figured out a way to just kind of toggle which mole you're on top of and another button that would hit the hammer based on other controls already in the game. And we were flabbergasted. He figured out a way to do it. And it even scores it. And if you get above a certain point, then your character's now walking around with a teddy bear. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty rad, man. It really is amazing what they do. We're as, as amazed watching what they come up with every week. And it's sometimes been very difficult to limit all of the videos that we found just from that last week to trim it just to 10. Because some weeks we have so much good stuff. We're like, ah, ah we got it. All right, we're going to meet with you next week because you're too good to throw up. We'll just put you in the next week. We've done that for the last few weeks. We've had like two or three that just keep carrying over to the next week. So it, it's it's really cool stuff that you can see there. We'll have to make sure you get me, uh, get me the links so that we can... Uh... You can shoot me an email later so I can make sure to get them in the show notes so people can check that stuff out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll give a couple of highlight videos that we use and then some of the most amazing ones that have come out of the community that are just mind-blowing, what they come up with. And what's really amazing, too, is that all these videos that you're going to see, 100% of it was all done inside our simulator. We have custom camera scripts and movements that it can be there. That There's no video trickery going on other than just editing the video with music. Everything that you're seeing shot there, shot inside of our simulator. Wow. That's really amazing stuff. You're, you'll be drooling on your keyboard. And uh, we don't reimburse for drooled on keyboards, by the way. <laughs> All right, I'll make sure to include that in the show notes also. So <laughs> basically, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're a self-taught 3D modeler? Pretty much, yeah. I had some guidance along the way. Um, the... Working at the at New World Computing, I, there was a stable of artists there, and I had some friends there that I could go to and ask for some help with certain things. And be like, "All right, I'm trying to do this. What's the best way to accomplish that?" And they'd be like, "Oh, you can try this, 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 this." So, doing that, and then just kind of figuring things out, I figured out ways that work for me to create the trains. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm the best at doing it because I have kind of a much more manual way of doing things, and there's a lot of the functions of uh, of what can be done there that are above what I know how to do or even have use of. Because I'm just making gray blocks. I'm not even texturing them. So I don't go into the many of the advanced modeling functions that are there. Uh, I kind of approach it, though, as a level design. I i don't want to spend a ton on, of polys on these things unless it's necessary. And even so, I still got to kind of keep it under control. Uh, a quick example on that one. You can make a, a cylinder that is perfectly round. It's got 300 some sides to the point where you cannot see any of those individual sides, right? And it looks perfect. But that's also 
300 sides, which since each of those is a rectangle, that's really 600 triangles around there, plus another 600 triangles on each end cap. So that's going to be 2,400 triangles just to make it look nice and round like that. You most likely aren't going to need that kind of detail. That's overkill like crazy, especially if that's just one cylinder and you have a whole train to build. So you can start dropping it down, but if you get down to something like, you know, four sides, a four-sided cylinder, that's a square. You know, five is a pentagon, uh, six is a hexagon. Those, you're going to definitely see the edges to it. Sometimes you can hide it if it's a very narrow uh, cylinder and it's just kind of like almost a wire. You won't be able to really tell that it's only got four sides on it when you get far enough away. Uh, if it's bigger than that, like it's a roller coaster wheel, which is going to be you know, substantial, maybe 12 inches or, you know, 16-inch diameter, you need more sides to make it look and appear around uh, on that one. So a lot of what I do is approaching it from that level design mentality, not the 3D modeling mentality of, I need to make it perform well, but also look good. Where is that balance point between perfectly round and a square that will look good from a reasonable distance away and perform well at the same time? And sometimes to make those shapes when it's more complicated than that, I actually kind of equate it to be a, like I'm playing with virtual clay or I'm uh, sculpting. Mm. As I will, I do drawings ahead of time to kind of figure out what I'm making a shape out of. And from there, I'll start drawing grid lines on it for where the polygons are going to be, where on that curved surface I'm going to actually break up that, sur that curve into specific segments. And then from there, I know what I'm going to build it out of and I start I make a, a primitive of that shape that's roughly there, then I start moving all of those points that I now have, all the points I need, move them into position, and I just kind of gradually shape it and get the shape I need, keeping a very tight control on the number of polygons used in there. So that's an insanely long-winded answer to, yes, I am pretty much self-taught on that uh, without any formal training there and pick up tricks that I need as I go along with it. So with picking up those tricks, are there any resources, uh, websites, books, anything that you'd recommend for somebody wanting to do 3D modeling? Um, you know, Google will help. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos that will show you specific things on the modeling program of your choice. That will show you tips and tricks on how to do that. And there's plenty of forums out there. I couldn't point you to any one specific one on that. Um, I would recommend for anybody that does want to get into modeling in the art side of a uh, in the game design business is to definitely take some classes. Uh, you know, having the, the actual instructor there giving you some of the basics of how to do certain things really does help. Because among other things, like learning for how to just build basic houses and basic simple objects like that, you also learn what's even more important, just the interface. What things do, what kind of controls are there, and that foundation and learning all the basics of how certain commands work and all of those various techniques allows you to then start putting other techniques on top of techniques and on other tricks together, and you start learning how to do those more advanced things just by seeing how they work. And that's one of the things that I didn't have as much of as the foundation in the basics like that. So I've figured out a lot of what I need as I've gone along, and I probably put more effort into what I need than I need to, but it works for what I need it to do, It's and I've been successful with it as well. So, um, But definitely, uh, if you can... You know, go into some, an art program if you're in school for that one and learn it. And if not, you can take some adult classes like that. They offer them. Uh, that would be the best way to go about just getting those the basic foundation in place. Uh, and then after that, if you're interested in breaking in with that aspect of it, uh, anything on the art side or the design side, you just have to do kind of what I did, what got me into No Limits to begin with, is you have to just create things. You have to start making things showing off the artwork, and to be honest, your first few tries at it, it's probably not going to be good. You know, my first uh, train was very simple. The first modification I did to an ultra coaster train, super simple, and I kind of built up from there. And I put things out there, got feedback. Some people liked it. Some people said, very cool, but you could do this. And you learn from those kinds of things, and you get better. The next one you do is better. And then you say, oh, very cool. Well, you could also have done this. Or... Nice, but it, you get more of what you're looking for by doing this. And those kinds of things teach you what, what's going on, and you learn from that. And you also learn to be critical of your own work so that you see that I like how this mostly turned out, but this could have been better, and I'm not entirely satisfied, so I need to find a way to make this thing better. And when you figure that kind of stuff out, now you're on the way 
Now you're learning how to build these basic shapes. You're learning the basic fundamentals of how to do 3D modeling, how to navigate around, and how to do what you need to do and get those shapes to appear, get the textures you need on there, start learning all these tricks and how to apply it effectively. And more importantly, you're building a portfolio. When you have a portfolio of actual work, especially things that are shown inside of a game that you've done for a project like that, even if it's, it's small, actual work showing what you're able to do helps because that's going to get you into more projects. Um, the fact that I had that portfolio of you know, four or five custom trains I built for really my own use and my own and other people that are interested in that one, that's the kind of thing that got every that really got me into No Limits and got me uh, noticed because the Ole had noticed my work because uh, it was out there uh, in the internet before I had a chance to even meet him and talk to him about it. So very, very important to learn the basics, keep trying, keep trying new things, and more importantly after all that is done to you know start building up that portfolio. Because once you show people what you can do and what you're capable of, even if it's not the exact thing for what their project is needs, you're showing that you have the ability to make things, come up with creative things, work in a team, and create what is necessary for that project. And that's what's going to get you more opportunities and get you where you want to go. So, I don't know if this answer is going to change or not, man, because uh, <laughs> you just gave some great, great advice there. But what would you tell 18-year-old Tom if he walked up to you and said, I want to get into the gaming industry? Well, 18-year-old Tom is kind of interesting because originally, you know, gaming was certainly fun, but it wasn't the thing I was first most interested in. I wanted to be a roller coaster engineer. I wanted to design roller coasters because uh, that was where my main passion was. And the trick there is that it's a very small number of people that do that. There, if I there, I could prattle off a, a number of companies around the world that do that, and I don't think I'd hit 10. Certainly, I wouldn't hit 15. It's just there's not a lot of companies that make those rides. And inside of those companies, there's maybe a guy that sits there and goes, okay, I'm going to have a loop here, I'm going to have a corkscrew here, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this. So that's the thing I wanted to do. Very, very difficult to get into that, and I did not see any kind of a path to get there. I've learned a lot more now on different avenues to get in related in there to find out more about that whole industry. Um, completely different topic for other kinds of podcasts for another time. Um, but what I'm getting at there is that the people that are involved in engineering and, and construction and building coasters like that and designing them, they're not specifically going after roller coasters per se. The engineers who do that, they're engineers who happen to work on roller coaster design. Um, you know, people who do programming, you know, that do game programming like that, they're programmers that program computer games. People who do 3D modeling for games, you know, they're 3D modelers, they're artists that do their work for video games. So the biggest thing I would tell 18-year-old Tom or anybody who's young and interested in there, it's great to be interested in games, but the actual aspect of it that you want to work on, and there's a lot of different ways that you can get in there, you have to be passionate about that part of it. If you like designing games and levels, you have to be passionate about making games and levels and rules and all that kind of stuff primarily that you just come up with games out of your spare time I, mean, I could leave you in a room with a blank sheet of paper you know a few random objects and a wastebasket and by the end of that you've got an entire rule set about how to throw it in there from the right thing and you get a whole scoring system within half an hour yeah you know, then you're going to be good for going into game designing games that are going to be fun for people to play you know you have to love programming and writing code to be a game programmer to be able to make it go, because you're going to be happy to make code that works. You know, you could be making a software database that just simply helps people to register for classes at school. But if you're a programmer, you just love to make that kind of stuff. The fact that you're doing it as for games is a bonus. So the core aspect of what you were very interested in, you got to be passionate about that and follow the pursuit of that discipline. And then see if you can then get that discipline into what you're what you really love to do. And then that really works out though. But primarily, you know, again, those coaster design guys, they're engineers first who are working on roller coasters. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well man, this has been great. I really uh, appreciate you taking the time to uh, to hang out with me tonight. What what's the best way that people can connect with you and find your game? Our, well our game is uh you can get there too. What's that? 
the simulator. Yes, it's our simulation there, um, and that's because it's there's no goal to it. It's sandbox. You know, we uh, we give you a very impressive one square mile of space to build in, uh, with 1,600 vertical uh, space to build in as well. So a giant amount of space. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to put that in perspective, if you're familiar with these parks in Southern California, you could take Disneyland, Knotts, and Disney's California Adventure and fit them all in the same build area in No Limits 2. There's that much space to put things together. So. Um, the way, if you want to pick up the game, you can go to nolimitscoaster.com. Uh, there you can try out the free demo or, of course, purchase the full version of that. Or you look us up on Steam. We are available there, and I'll get you the link as well. If you want to get a hold of our, our official uh, social media, you can go to facebook.com slash nolimitscoaster. You can go to uh, at nolimitscoaster on Twitter and follow us there. Uh, also, we have our No Limits YouTube page, uh, which is uh, our channel there. It's uh, no limits. The letter U tube, I believe, is what that one is, um, and that's our official channel in there. That's where we post our weekly updates. Uh, I'll get you the link too, so that people can go to that one specifically. And we have a Reddit page as well, uh, which is uh, slash r slash No Limits Coaster. Uh, those are the official ways to get a hold of that. If anybody would like to chat with me for any reason, you can find me on Twitter at ride r i d e underscore o p. Uh, for write up, and I'll be happy to chat with you there. Or email me at my No Limits address, which is uh, Tom underscore Zelif, Z E L I double F as in Frank, at No Limits Coaster dot D E, because it's actually a German website there for our blog there. Uh, those are the various ways that you can get a hold of us. I think I did enough plugging for the evening. How about you? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was great, man. Uh, I do want to say make sure to send me your at least one of your favorite videos that I can include in the show notes so that uh, uh, people can easily check it out right there. Absolutely, will do. There's a, a... Boy, it's tough to narrow down because there's so many good ones out there, but I'm probably going to be sending over this one. Um, there's a roller coaster at a park in England called Alton Towers, and the coaster is called Air. Uh, and it was the very first flying coaster from this particular company. And somebody made a perfect recreation of it, just... Every aspect of it is perfect, down to the ride height signs out in front that are the right height for the riders going in there. In metric, of course, in centimeters, not or 1.6 meters, I think is what it is, or 1.8. Uh, they even have the audio recordings that play in the queue of "Welcome to Air," blah 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 blah. All that. He's got everything perfectly in there. And another one of the fans was given the opportunity to make a video of this uh, all shot with his unique camera styles inside of um, No Limits 2 and you're looking at a, at a movie. It's just absolutely remarkable. That would be one of two. I'll send you one other one that was particularly amazing. Somebody else put together an entire video that uh, he calls it the Cube, and he made himself a uh, virtual amusement park out of Legos inside of No Limits 2. Wow. And what's amazing is that it doesn't just start with everything there. It starts off with just one piece. And then you know, buildings kind of get built and formed, and as the camera's moving along, then another building fades in and fades in. It's like he keeps building it and then taking more video as he's going along. And he's used the, the scripting and all sorts of other cool tricks in the background to make the coasters look like they're built, made out of Lego in there, but scaled down to Lego-sized people and everything like that. And it's got mazes and rides that you can ride, everything made out of Lego and planes flying around. And... Uh, it's about a 10-minute video, but it's so trippy to look at because it's just fascinating to watch that kind of imagination at work. So I'll, I'll get you the links to those and show you where you can find our roundups as well because the, the, the stuff that shows up there every week that we're, we're getting out of our community is quite amazing. Yeah, it sounds like everything is awesome. It really is. Did, did you get that right there by chance mm -hmm. from the Lego movie? And it's really cool when you're part of a team. <laughs> Oh, yes, I am a movie nerd, too, and I can quote you into the ground, buddy. <laughs> it's good stuff. Oh, that yeah, was great, great man. Too. So much fun. All right, buddy. Well, hey, I do appreciate you taking the time, and uh, hey, you know what? In a couple of months or whatever, hit me up. Maybe we can do this again and find out uh, just you know how things are going with Steam and everything else, and um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I certainly had a lot of fun here and appreciate uh, getting the chance to kind of tell my story and how you know, talk for quite a while and uh, just kind of show how everything everything works in there. And if nothing else, to leave your uh, your viewers with who are interested in that, you, you just you keep going after it. You know, it's 
it's sometimes difficult to find all of the opportunities that are there, uh, and they're sometimes very limited. But you never want to let that stop you. you. Always, if you love doing it, keep doing it. Keep getting better at it. Get as good at it as you possibly can, and then get better at it. And just keep doing it because you love doing it. And then you'll have this nice library of work. People will notice that. And then people will start offering to have you help do it. And then eventually, the goal for everybody, as much as they say, ah, you shouldn't sell out. Well, if you can get somebody to pay you to do what you're passionate about, you're not working. You're having fun and getting a paycheck for it. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Well said. All right, my friend, you have yourself a great night. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Absolutely. Too. See you later, guys.